Hi, good evening. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our live leadership masterclass, Rising to the Top Leadership Masterclass with the Veterans. I am Surbhi Mahobia. I am Narrator in Chief and Director of Communications with Historians Industries and the host for this evening. Before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce the online events platform Storians. Uh, we are an exclusive online events platform by Historians Industries, where we bring experts and thought leaders from all professions, businesses, and industries to share their stories with us and with you. Historians Industries is a lifestyle startup with presence in electronics, healthy living, and inclusive employment market. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Lieutenant General Balbir S. Sandhu. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir is an Ar Indian Army soldier, sportsman, and leader. Sir lived Army as a way of life for 39 years and held key appointments in all arms operational environment. He served as an instructor at all premier defense institutions, including the NDA and the Defense Services Staff College. Sir has held most coveted appointments and attended all prestigious professional courses, including the National Defense College, besides serving extensively in operational areas, primarily in the Northeast Theater. He held the appointment of Director General of Information Technology of the Indian Army, besides heading his parent corps as Director General of Supplies and Transport. For his distinguished service, he has been awarded Ati Vashisht Seva Medal and Vashisht Seva Medal, along with Army Commander's Commendation Card. As a sportsman, he has represented Indian Army and Indian Polo teams in both national and international arenas. Currently, he is the Vice President of Indian Polo Association and is advisor to the President Equestrian Federation of India. He is also a member of the General Committee of Delhi Golf Club. On superannuation, his zeal to pass on his wealth of knowledge, experience and learnings from the army with a wider audience encouraged him to work with strategic think tanks along with becoming a motivational and leadership coach. Sir has also spoken on prestigious platforms like TEDx, news channels and participated in seminars on supply chain management and national security. He has recently submitted his thesis towards completion of his PhD. Uh, looking at his experience through a corporate lens, Sir has, um, uh, has designed programs to manage strategy, human resources, supply chain management, training, and team building. Welcome, Sir. Thank you so much for joining us here this evening. Uh, it's, it's my honor to interact with you, and I'm sure our audiences feel the same way. There will be a question and answer session at the end, so viewers can write their questions in the comments. Uh, right. Shurbi, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure interacting with you uh, and uh, share my experiences with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Um, today in this Leadership Masterclass, our topic of discussion will be New Age Leadership. That is leadership in the age of digital and digitization. So uh, to start with, sir, what does it mean to be an effective leader in an environment characterized by increasing digital disruption? You know, uh, one thing which is which is common uh, is change. Right. I, I joined the army as a cadet at National Defense Academy in 1975. I was commissioned in 78 and our generation is extremely lucky to have seen an era when we used to, uh, you know, uh, ring the telephone like this and then the exchange, say, hello, sir. Then you say, can you get me? So, so he says, oh, wait, 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 getting you, getting you, got you, sir, something like that. And then they will <laughs> ring back, right? And I remember once, uh, I was serving in a counterinsurgency area and mm -hmm. I was holding an I had to be awake, the, you know, I had to be available on the phone any time of the night. So I used to pull that one with that gumane wala in my, uh, under the mosquito net and then mm -hmm. krrr will happen and you will listen. And then the first time, the first time it was, I think somewhere around 
beginning of this century when we got the indian army's dedicated uh, lines and i understood later that is a multi channel so you dialed like std and in the civil std it takes a little longer in those days and as used to you know just you know you could speak from somewhere in nagaland to a place in jammu and kashmir so that change in technology and we used to uh, i by the way i am i am an arts graduate from national defense academy but one thing i have been very passionate about is technology because if people like us don't learn about it and i don't have to do it i have to get it done right so even as a dg it is not my business i am a user right, right. so right. Uh, the only thing uh, those who want to succeed in life you have to find ways and means to keep up with technology and for last 3 years of post my retirement wherever i go in any seminars in any any think tank studies one thing which can really cut the story short or help you take a faster action to reach the goal that you so desire is technology and right. you know ranging from uh, what uh, 3d internet of things artificial intelligence they are all very very interesting the earlier a leader learns about it he doesn't have to do it or she doesn't have to do it earlier you learn about it earlier you understand the application which is so simple and interesting i'll tell right. you an incident i was there as a brigadier somewhere in a field area that's the first time earlier we used to send a message to a signal center and we have right. a teaching where you said uh, you don't say reference because you have to say words you say your so and so uh keep this stop do this thirdly tell me so that you minimize words and right. in this somewhere in early um, turn of the century again this system came like email we could send right. on the army lines to our headquarters so okay. uh, hesitation our, our staff would continue to doing that old story so we were told that this thing has come so i said in my i mean it was it was a great feeling in our next meeting the mm-hmm. the signal guy says is the only branch which has violated nothing and which has made sure everything goes from their office is so and so branch and i was the most uneducated out of them the others were engineers and signals and other so i have been extremely extremely indebted to technology i have been extremely extremely uh, you know uh, kind of first to adopt it so those right. of us wish to wish to multiply or wish to we add value to our organization efficiency right. to our thing technology gives you a shorter version of doing it so you right. have to be saying very true and i'm sure that even i mean i'm sure i mean it's very humble of you to say that you know you're you're not much aware but i am sure that despite of having such qualified men it's it's equally imperative to keep that certain level of knowledge so that you know you know what what's going on and you're up to date with all the terms and terminologies and you know all that jazz that surrounds the technology you know as as you go up there are people to help you right if you right. if you don't right. have that hesitation to seek help from your subordinates they only to willing right. to help you and i think there is a, in a subject where somebody else is qualified i have no f- business to feel hesitant and uh, it's a very harmonious relationship of learning and then questioning the person on the same field you told me it should happen this way why is it not happening so, <laughs> so it's workable it's workable yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so as a leader i i really need to understand that there's that as a leader when you and leaders in general are you know always hard pressed there 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 are always goals there are targets there are aims to achieve there are there are year year in closing quarter in closing it's always a race always not a day goes by when there is not a there is no fire to extinguish so in all of this how to remain self aware and not focus on the external disruptions like like this this was a, a completely unforeseen situation that the world is facing right now so so how, what do you have to say on this okay uh, let me tell you one thing uh, when i was a directing staff in staff college uh, uh, just for right. the information of the viewers 
uh, right. people come there with uh, after qualifying an exam somewhere in the middle of your service you are a major and everyone right. is, this is the first step to uh, you know separate some officers from the others in terms of qualification and that enhances their employability and they do all start aspiring to become you know pick up higher positions in the indian army and i used right. to tell this group of people i said listen guys uh, we have a syndicate of eight or nine boys officers right. And I was a yeah. colonel. They were majors. I said, "Let one thing be very clear: all of us are keen to go up in life. All of us are keen to become generals. And let's not have any, any, any. Let's not pretend anything about it. However, yeah. there are two ways of there are two ways of doing it. There is mm -hmm. one person who says my organization must grow, and I yeah. should get the byproduct, and that yeah. byproduct should make me general. So if the byproduct has to make you general, the organization has to really grow." Right. right. There's another right. person who says, "I must become a general. I don't mind the organization growing." Mm -hmm. Right. He's not anti-organization at all. So my take is the organizational goals and the targets given to you, be it in the corporate or in the military or in the civil services, are supreme. You can have no compromise. And let me tell you one thing: those of us who do those things well. And mm. do them with passion. Uh, mm. You learn. That's that's also a way of your self awareness, self learning. Okay. You know, uh, I am. I always feel when you are young, when you are early in service, and as you grow up, there are different things you have to learn. So when you are young, you have to be passionate about your job and build capabilities. Like I said, if I am not good at computers, I must learn computers. If I need to be in a place which needs physical fitness, I get up half an hour early, get physically fit. I was at a appointment where I had to work 14 hours on the on the paper, uh, you know, a lot of paperwork. So that's right. the time I told myself I cannot afford not to do exercise. So all that it involves is getting up half an hour early. That's it. So okay. your self awareness. Time will always be 365 days and 24 hours in a day. You can't say, I haven't got time. You haven't been able to prioritize it. So if you are a true leader, you will be able to readjust your work by delegating and mm -hmm. by having a better rapport with your team who will work for you, who will make sure that you meet the target. Targets are not going to be met by you alone. They, they, you'll, you'll have, a, have a team doing it. Do you have the ability to have that communication with the team? And one of the best ways we say in the army, one of the principles, uh, methods of leadership is setting an example. So I always say build your capability. And there's a very famous share by Iqbal. We say, Kudi ko kar buland itna ke har takdeer se pehle khuda bande se ye khud puche bata teri raza kya hai. Right. So what it means is, make yourself so competent that your seniors should say, yeah, out of these eight, 10 guy, he is the one who will do it. And your subordinate must feel, yeah, I'm glad to be tasked with this chap. You know, he, he, he will let, not let us into trouble. We'll come back with glory. And your comrade should be convinced, yes, I, come on, yeah, he's the guy, he deserves it. So yeah. that comes by building your comp competence. Mm -hmm. And there is a place to do both the organizational goals as mm -hmm. well as your own self-awareness and, and self-development. Uh, so it, it's doable, I feel. I feel it's doable. And uh, one has been lucky to do it, but that, that's the way, yeah. You spoke about delegation. And I feel that when it, delegation is the hardest job. Mm -hmm. After becoming a manager and then further growing up into a leadership role, I believe, um, that delegation is the hardest job because that requires you to trust others, tr have trust in people and trust enough that they maintain a certain standard because it's not just your, uh, it's not just work because it's your reputation at stake, your team's reputation at stake, your organization's goals are going to get hampered if things don't fall in place or don't happen as per the plan. How can someone come over their trust issues? How can you, can someone trust someone to do the job for them? Coming uh, overcoming trust issues is a very hard thing. Because it's easy na ki yar ye din din laga ke karega. Main khud karunga, mere se ek din mein ho jayega. To main khud hi kyun na kar dun? So how do you overcome that? See, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. 
uh, one is uh, leadership is a continuous process right okay. i agree okay. with you uh, this trust cannot be built in one day and nor it can it be through an injection or some tablet that you say you know let's have trust in each other no it is okay. that is that exactly is what leadership is all about have you been able this is the the, call, uh, the definition of leadership is willing obedience of of the people of your subordinates to do things for you the way you want them to be done right now another thing about delegation is have you trained your subordinates you cannot delegate and then start shouting at the person and i agree with you i agree with you i as a manager or i as a commanding officer cannot have a failure because of my subordinate not performing to the level that i desire right exactly. you have to have checks and balances and uh, to tell you an incident uh, hmm. i used to as a as a commanding officer i used to tell people i said you guys must be thinking you know look at this ceo he panics and he comes and he tasks us then then he comes in comes to check it i said because i cannot go to my headquarter and tell them that i failed because i had a incompetent subordinate i said that incompetence will be mine so i said call me panicky but i am going to intervene and i am going to put checks and balances by which you will give me enough cushion that i cover up your substandard work to get it to my standards before i present it to outsider so it's about trust it's about building trust over a period of time i think very important thing is to build capabilities in your subordinates Very. you know that other thing i i would rather do it now you have to define clearly what am i going to do it myself and what am i going to do get it done from the subordinates something right. where you have room to correct them get it done by them something which is too critical maybe you do it yourself and th- those lines should be very clear th- so that you don't get tension of delegating and then feeling let down so there very is a true. way of doing it. i'm sure you can very true Co- coaching is definitely one of the very important aspect of any leadership role um so um I, I, while while i was researching um for this interview i came across something very interesting which said um when conflict arises approach it from a place of curiosity rather than feeling victimized what are your thoughts on conflict resolution from this perspective it's very hard that if somebody objects or give a critical feedback you it's easy to take it personally and it starts feeling like a personal failure it's it's very easy to you know take that burden of failure how how do you what, what do you think about it so uh you know i think uh, your your personal thoughts your egos must stay in your personal life when you are in a official position one thing which you must pack up mm-hmm. and leave it at home is ego because like i said okay. uh people really value those subordinates those middle ranking leaders those leaders uh who mm-hmm. are who shed ego conflict right. becomes much easier to to solve or to resolve if you keep ego aside and which right. would mean that you have kept the communication open right mm. and second is uh i should be too long a story to tell you uh the sum total is in an organization you are lucky yeah. if people criticize you and tell mm. you your shortcomings half the people as they grow up they become such terrors that the subordinates do not have the access and the and the and the guts to tell them that this is wrong, wrong. those subordinates or peers who tell you what is wrong with you uh, oh. is is there for your benefit and you should be able to sift it out who is saying saying with a view to just trouble you or right. let you down and you know you thank that, that guy also but don't listen to the person so i mm-hmm. think in an organization uh if you keep, keep ego aside uh mm-hmm. you will you will be able to uh have have much better conflict resolution second right. is you do not always have to follow hierarchical uh structure or line of thought mm-hmm. you know uh, you have to have out of the box thinking Right. you have to have a more box thinking Absolutely. sometimes somebody probably doesn't get along well to get resolved by the immediate senior or somebody 
Yeah. So maybe uh, you're going to down or something, but you can't do it overnight. You should yeah. have had built that culture where where uh, people expect you and people understand you. People secure sec your immediate subordinates feel yeah. secure about you going to down. I'll tell you um, when I was the director general uh, supplies and transport. Uh, mm -hmm. Your major generals are your ADGs, and okay. then you have a brigadier and a colonel, and also okay. a major general has a lot of important job to do. So he'll come to you with a file, and you raise a question. He says, "Sir, I'll get back to you," because I know that he has to go and ask that colonel because this man is handling five six portfolios. So I told them one day, I said, "Yeah, listen, why don't you send that colonel to me straight?" And so we reached a stage where I mean, these are very good guys. All of them risen to the next rank. And I used to, I to really thank them. I said the way that you work. This was right on a file recommended for your sanction. Major or a colonel so and so is carrying the file to explain it to you. Right. You know they were right. absolutely secure, right? right. So right. conflict resolution uh, can be as much by conflict prevention, so that you don't allow the conflict to happen on frivolous issues. Right. And uh, right. if you have the if you have the confidence of your subordinates. And as you go up, I'll be mm. speaking later as well. You you right. have to right. feel feel great about your subordinate, and if they trust you, uh, you will right. be the biggest right. conflict uh, solver uh, right. in your right. team. And uh, uh, conflicts will be there, but if you have this this kind of a rapport, I'm sure you can resolve. Ego, keep your ego aside. <laughs> I was about to say this, and I think e keeping ego aside has to do a lot with self awareness. So this uh, exercises of self awareness should never be out of syllabus for their entire career span. Yeah, 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 yeah. So have you ever used um, uh, any conflicts to bring teams together or align the team with your goals? Because there's always a silver lining to every conflict. There's always something beneficial come out of conflicts and it's mostly usually good for everybody the team the organization the aims the goals have you used any conflicts in your favor uh see i'll tell you long back th this is a management theory which somebody once i went before we, we do a course in mao a senior command course before we take over command of units so i contested this theory of at times they said create conflict and competition to get them to perform better and get together uh, right. i feel i feel in a team especially in the military and so should it be for the corporate because i always say corporates are always uh, on in operation we are sometime in peace and other times in war or in uh, counter insurgency i feel uh, it should be incidental if you use if the conflict it results in bringing two teams together, which it should happen. Suppose there's a conflict between two small, uh, two sub branches of your organization, and by yeah. resolving the conflict, you use that thing to again get them socially and otherwise together. Uh, right. That is absolutely doable and one must do. But to have or to be looking from the side at a conflict to get them to perform better, I I, right. I wouldn't like to do that. But yes, if you are able to. Uh, I mean, create a social and personal rapport between two mm -hmm. groups or two people, thereafter enhancing efficiency of your organization and right. being able to tell them, okay, listen, guys, you know, I, I, I've been another advocate of a thing called win-win. Let's not play zero sum. In India, in India, I have seen probably, you know, either as a culture or whatever. We say for me to go, go up, this person must come down. You don't know that there is a place for both of you to go up. And I've been a great beneficiary of this. Once in a, in a conference uh, with our general, I was a colonel. So I said uh, uh, in my part of the briefing, I said, uh, I've done this, this, this. Thanks to A, B and C because they've been great support. This, 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 this. I spoke two minutes and after that they said, sir, uh, I was a little senior to them. They were, again, they said, "Sir, this is the first time we've seen. We are your, we are your uh, contemporaries or so-called rivals." And you think I said, "I'm not a fool." I said, "That chap is smart enough to understand that I am producing the goods, and I have been able to utilize your services." <laughs> I said, "There is, there is no competition between you and me. 
you are exactly. on your own i'm in my own field we all can grow god was right. kind that so i feel uh, you can grow uh, by uh, creating a healthy competition by re- reducing or minimizing or resolving conflict and thereafter have your team going at a faster pace very true also i believe that it has a lot to do with the insecurities that creep in as you grow up because uh, the 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 gully narrows down basically there are not many people and you are not you are not irreplaceable you're not irreplaceable basically even no matter how how at the top you are in the hierarchy you're always indispensable so uh, i think it has to do a lot with insecurities that also come at that point in time you know so much inside and outside of the organization that you mostly start understanding what is wrong with you and what is wrong with other others and what can work and what cannot work you know it might be a little difficult it might be a little difficult to uh, to follow what i'm saying yeah. but you have to taking stock of yourself right mm. you and not have your ambitions not matching your capabilities there's something right. known as assessment right right remember right. remember uh, you must look inside and tell yourself if you don't deserve to be the ceo or a general be happy with a brigadier or whatever right. next rank and happiness happiness means a lot more than just your your financial state or you're just going up i've seen people going up and then landing up only in hospitals and getting abused because of their incompetence right so i feel one is your ambitions you must be honest to yourself to match your ambition with your capabilities two is i think especially at the middle and the lower level and not at the higher level right your sole ambition should be competence let me become so good let me so become so good if they don't promote me promote me the loss is theirs otherwise i'll go in for an alternate alternate course of action i am competent i have set my ambitions to a level i've seen a lot of people who are very happy uh, even at at the level of retiring as a colonel there are a lot of people who are unhappy retiring as a major general because he thought he's he should be going that way so uh, i feel i feel uh, you should never feel insecure you have to mm-hmm. work towards that and mm-hmm. uh, if you continue to build competence uh, mm-hmm. it will give you more security and then of course uh, if you are a organization person who's contributing to the organization let me mm-hmm. tell you one thing the hierarchy top hierarchy doesn't find too many competent people to hold leadership positions so if you if you are capable competent organization person you will get more than you do and if, if an organization doesn't give you the due the losses of the organization will find another place very true and and despite that despite of having all the qualification despite of having talents and working for so hard and when currently when we are in an age of information technology where information is available at a click at a tap i mean you don't have to now you know um, scrum through libraries and books anymore so mm-hmm. even then uh, people are struggling to step into leadership roles and those who are into leadership roles um, face fierce competition and and finding it hard to keep up with their positions why do you think that is see uh, one thing is everything uh, every every technology every advancement comes with a price right you uh, you may have information at the click of a button but you can as well be killed by information overload right Absolutely. to sift to sift the right kind of information let me tell you one thing uh, if you give open book exam more and more people are likely to land up in trouble because they'll get attracted to something and keep writing and missing the other four points that they had to give so uh, this uh, extra information available is as much an asset as a as a as a hindrance right yeah. so leadership human beings will never be replaced by technology and mm-hmm. human beings cannot in the present era succeed without technology so it has okay. to be a very happy mix nobody mm-hmm. is going to replace your personal qualities to get the best out of the technology right mm-hmm. if you are right. a person who has not been able to use this properly 
uh, you may have uh, have your have your data sabotage you may have what what do you call all these uh, uh, information raids um, the word i'm forgetting so okay. you probably probably uh, your you know your websites will be will be raided by by your adversaries and right. for lack of security you might land up in trouble you don't have a proper team they don't mind passing off your information corporate information somewhere right. Right? so leaders will have their own place leadership mm -hmm. skills will have their own place and technology will enable it or maybe a, a disaster for incompetent leaders so so both both things have place to survive <laughs> yeah <laughs> very true so what does it exactly mean uh, you know in a in a diverse in a globalized workforce and now more so because the the physical boundaries have blurred now now anybody can work from anywhere um so you know this this generation of this diverse and globalized workforce that must be engaged with a broad and corporate vision um, in a way that it still fits in their local cultures and values and expectations how what does it mean to lead in this kind of a scenario see uh, of course the world has become a global uh, village there's no doubt on that culture right. cultures uh, cultural differences uh, information is now connecting people more and more so right. one thing is very clear with this information explosion and with this connectivity globally hmm uh basic principles of leadership will not change right everyone understands the 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 same things of you know leading a you know men men in the case of army from front uh mm. understanding their pains and mm. of the very important thing i can take this lesson from the army do you know that in the indian army if a south indian officer is commissioned into sikh regiment he learns punjabi oh. and yeah you have to learn the language of your troops okay. and when you are commissioned as an officer for first few months you don't live in the officers mess you live with your men right you live in the barrack you use the community bathroom you eat the food that they eat in the sense that you know gurkha will be eat somebody will eat with more mirchi somebody so you have to eat all that and you have to learn about every person uh uh their their culture and during your leave you go to their villages and meet their families you have to understand how many whose mother is sick whose who has how many children everything you are supposed to know so whether you are working at a place a b or c mm -hmm. basic principles of leadership stay however you have to be extremely sensitive to the mm -hmm. tradition to the work culture and other issues that are followed by the community you are leading or by the people you are leading right okay. you cannot force fit a leader is supposed to change uh, his 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 or her goal is only efficiency output uh, and achievement of goal be it in the military on the corporate or anywhere else but working um, environment must be conducive to the larger population that is the t so the person will have to uh, learn the culture the the work culture the overall culture develop a repo whichever way you can uh, you are going to get much more output out of it and people globally anywhere uh, are emotional and relationship right. are important in leadership and right. it cannot be a mathematical uh, kind of uh, tasking and output Uh, stuff so you as long as you are aware if you can learn a bit of the language if you can follow a bit of their customs if you can be sensitive to their sensitivities and if you can attend their festivals uh, be a little but like adopt their dresses wherever feasible i okay. think you're going to get much more output out of that so you have to you have to respect and understand the culture and uh, we, we call it um, you know officer subordinate relationship and that right. that has to be a very it has to have its own sanctity because right. uh, the buck stops with the leader so it's the leader right. who has to transform change than the than others yeah very true very true so in your four uh, decades of uh, experience you must have 
come across many generations of officers, soldiers, and colleagues. And you must have seen the uh, era from activism of 70s to liberalism of 90s and now to millennials. So how does a leader keep up with so much flux? And you know, there's this huge generation gap. Um, and you know, and, and, and then the leadership styles and the working styles also transcend from different styles of working, um, from con ranging from conservative to flexible. So how, how does a leader keep up with all of this? Okay, you know, Indian Army, uh, I joined in 78 as an officer, till about mm -hmm. 10 years of my uh, service, Indian okay. Army used to re recruit soldiers who had done class 5. Okay. Then they went to the qualification for a general soldier was made to class 8. And some oh. of the old timers, they said this is the biggest mistake they're doing. Right. A person who's so educated, is not going to get led to be dying uh, in war. Then it went to 10, and now I think it is 10th or 12th, right? 10th, yes. yes. it is 10th. Yes. GD soldier, and then it goes up. But uh, let me tell you one thing, uh, the, the motivational factors have to be recalibrated a bit, right? right. And right. if the if you if these soldiers today they've got an example in Kargil, they are there in uh, Ladakh now wherever. So likewise, uh, the person who has to who has more maturity, who has more understanding of leadership, is the higher leadership. This right. uh, understanding the change has to has to be trickling down from top to bottom, bottom right? Yeah. And right. you can skip you can skip a few steps. I have seen in my experience. When you are at a, at a say a comparatively higher leadership position, if you right. go and talk uh, in a little um, in a manner that a youngster would like to, they accept you very well and they understand uh, you. And another thing is, if you play sports with them, if you play games, say you play a game of golf, you play football, whatever, that's a great binding factor or basketball, whatever. So playing sports is one way you can cut across generations. Right. And I think it's a must. It's a must. It really paid me dividend. You mm -hmm. must have, uh, you must give a, not give an impression or you must, you must um, deal, your must relationship must be with your subordinates where mm -hmm. they feel you are uh, accessible. And you can be like, I'll tell you, uh, here, whenever I took over as the, as the head of my service, so in the first conference, I told the gentleman, I, I'm no longer uh, Balbir Singh. I'm your DGST. So uh, my conduct affects your 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 reputation. Uh, we know what I drink, where do I drink, how do I behave? So I said, I'm accountable to that last guy there, that youngest, younger officer. And you have an access to my office to just enter. If you hear anything wrong about the whole code and people say, Ab kya kare, aise to chalta hai, you, I said, you'll not accept it. Please enter my office. Ask me the answer to that question. I'll give you the answer. I don't want to ask you who asked you that question. But I said, don't take it. So a leader has to be accountable to the subordinates. A leader, you know, there is a, there is a very famous uh, Shabd by Guru Gobind Singh, which says, Whatever I am as a leader, I am courtesy mm -hmm. the hard work of my subordinates. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, there are crores of guys lying like me. I was very lucky to command a unit as a major and thereafter. See, I firmly believed in this. So it's your subordinates who work, you get credit. It's your subordinates. Who work and you get an AVSM and a VSM. It's not that you are a wrestler and you got it yourself. So, right. so the fact of the matter is, you have to learn to uh, change with the changing, uh, changing uh, generations. And you won't believe. Uh, maybe I don't know. I, I've been a person who was very critical. I always told people, "Well done, guys," but you know, you could have done this and this and that. But in the last uh, appointment. Uh, I used to have a monthly conference and I think my chaps used to work hell of a lot. So uh, in the end, I was supposed to sum up after two, three hours of their presentation. And uh, it used to come from my heart. I said, gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, all that I can say is thank you to you. 
because I never work for somebody the way you work for me. And I said, even when I put my red pen and tick you off, I fully understand how much hard work has gone from you. But it's my business to do it. So please, you all understand. I understand that you worked on a Saturday and Sunday at home. Then only you could produce this document because it is all official work. There's no field work in the headquarters. So you have to value your subordinates. They will give you 10 times in return. And you have to learn to, to change because you are the one who has the resources to change. You are the one who needs to change. Right? And they will respond. Right. Okay. Very true. And, and I am very interested. I'm actually very curious to not turn the tables. Have you faced any sort of, you know, uh, any, any sort of uh, negativity or some sort of from any of your leader or somebody? Have you faced that generation gap? Did you feel that generation gap, that, that misunderstanding of generations? Did you feel that ever in your career? Me as a junior you're talking of? Yes, yes. Very often, very often, very often. And uh, I've, been, I've been very lucky to at times having been able to express my, my dissent and being accepted as such. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was retiring, right. in all my dining out speeches, we have a number of places to go. I said, you know, I stand today not to thank those, you know, who reported very well on me because I worked for them. It was their business. It was their duty. I said, right. stand here to thank those who are my seniors with whom uh, we use the army language to pangas with whom I, I expressed my dissent. And they were they were kind enough right. to understand me, and still still let me you know go forward. So uh, I somehow have felt that, especially in the armed forces, uh, you have a lot right. of room to stay, provided you are competent. Your competence will be respected. Your dissent will be respected if you are competent. You know you are doing ten things for the organization where they appreciate you. So they will take uh, some some descent from you. Like since I ride, you know, a good horse will always buck, right? So you have to be ready to right. come down. I had maximum falls from right. my best polo ponies right. because uh, I used to never exercise her too much. And whenever at times I'm practicing with a little relaxed thing, she would buck and I'll come down. And once I landed up in the hospital for almost five days with my <laughs> back swollen. So uh, I have yeah. felt it. But I've been very lucky. I've been very lucky that whatever I expressed, uh, people accepted it. Once one person said, no, you are so frustrated today. And now you'll tell me, no, this army is useless. And my son will not join army. I said, no, sir, uh, army doesn't become useless. I have never felt it that way. I shall never feel that way. Just because one odd uh, general in the Indian army behaves in a certain manner. So it was so sweet yeah. of the person who accepted it. <laughs> I was a little colonel that time. So uh, army, army gives you, and uh, let me also tell you the converse. Right. Uh, once I was, when I was a commanding officer, one captain one day, you know, shouting at someone, yeah, there, yeah, oh, and I came from outside. I said, come into my office, and he tells me, no, sir, you know, I'm being bullied by so and so, so and so, and uh, you know, uh, uh, he hinted, and because they are your friend, I said, who said they are my friend? I said, firstly, stop. Uh, you know, don't don't raise your voice. And right. I told him, I said, you have a right to behave in this manner. So at the end, I felt so good that day that I never lost my shirt on him. And he was shouting, literally shouting. So probably as you grow, uh, you have to have the maturity to take dissent. That helps you. And uh, uh, I mean, good right. leaders will accept dissent. And the same person will give you 10 times more respect thereafter. So that's it. Very true. Very, very true. Very true. Um, my next question is, um, how does leadership shift to deal with the business environment? Um, you know, with, with uh, where rapid technological changes have exponentially, exponentially shortened the shelf life of products and processes. Um, it ha I mean, technology has a major role to play in it. That are um, now everything is so so fast paced i mean gone are the days when there is this a product launch or anything would used to take months and months and abhi to you decide in 15 days ki 15 din baad hame 
ये कैंपेन लॉन्च करना है एंड एवरीबडी इज लाइक ऑल हैंड्स ऑन डेक एंड वर्किंग ट्वेंटी फोर सेवन फॉर नेक्स्ट फिफ्टीन डेज टू गेट दैट कैंपेन लाइव दैट प्रोडक्ट इन द मार्केट राइट ऑन द शेल्फ इन द शॉप्स सो हाउ हाउ डज द लीडरशिप डील विद दिस काइंड ऑफ एन एनवायरमेंट I feel, uh, like I said in the very first uh, opening question, right. something which is it is common is change. Oh yes, it's yes. Change. So those who do not foresee a change, a uh, army, me there is a principle of warfare called forethought right. and planning. Okay. Right. You sh- right. a leader must have the ability to mm. think ahead. right mm. what right. tools do you use if technology is available tomorrow you have 10 rupees and right. the leadership which is bright mm. is not going to spend on the past they say the next those those army which fight the next war as the last war are bound to lose the next war will not be like this the last war right, right. so right. The, the 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 operational competition and the cutthroatism in the corporate world is much more so right. those leaders the leaders have to dedicate time for perspective planning forethought mm-hmm. and planning right. it is your business to probably divert resources to futuristic thinking right, right. and uh, uh, i am sure you might be beaten twice but you can't be beaten every time and expect people to probably outdo you somewhere and uh, what china has done in last 40 years is just that they could think ahead they could think 40 years ahead and they could create uh, you know some simple minor changes at times can be game changes correct right hire the leadership at times you have to look at minor changes which uh, which immediately change the the, the margin of profit or thing mm-hmm. so technology and mm-hmm. dedication of time to forethought and planning and perspective planning has to mm-hmm. be part of your process you cannot sit on laurels of status quo very true very true very well said sir mm-hmm. um now now since the turn of the century the the speed at which the businesses have been accelerating has been really fast and the businesses are going very mm-hmm. rapidly exponentially but a disruption like covid 19 has fluttered the economic systems massively businesses have shut people have lost their jobs um, there there's so much unrest in the economies world over how does a how does a leader remain stable yet innovative to solve for 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 an unseen problem something that is not foreseen see uh, i think it'll be untrue or unrealistic to have expected the leadership of 2018 and 19 to uh, understand that there will be some th- pandemic like this however however right. uh, we have a thing called contingency planning correct right and in correct. the in the in the corporate world you call it risk mitigation strategy right so in the army in the army we work on the on the concept of just in case mm mm-hmm. just in case is if it happens this way what are my resources if it happens this way what are my resources if this right. bridge break what are my resources right, right. so right. as a result as a result you put in much more resources to cater for the contingencies and risk mitigation whereas right. in the corporate world since the margins are so thin they talk right. about just in time especially in right. case of logistics so right. you try to uh, minimize uh, reserves you right. try to uh say uh, don't bother if if it happens that is it doesn't matter when it happens we'll see right right so right. probably probably one lesson that the corporates should have to learn hereafter is what are my alternate plans hmm. right risk right. mitigation strategies will always cost will always cost uh, resources okay. and you will agree with me hmm. uh some people who must have been cribbing for a reduced margin of say 1 rupee at some stage uh, mm-hmm. you know have lost it by 100 rupees now and they are still you know bearing it not right. the best of the things to have happened but maybe maybe you will have reduced margins but uh, keep a cushion for uh, contingency which is unforeseen and this right. uh, i'm very sure 
uh, post covid a lot of lessons are going to be learned by the management schools uh, on risk mitigation but yeah. army said we live in disruptions as we live in in a, in a, in a, in a, our, our whole concept of perspective planning planning is based on uh, things going wrong right yeah. enemy interference whether you are in such remote places that we yeah. work on concept of holding reserves holding alternate location say for a weapon everything so i would say one thing that you can do for unforeseen circumstances is to have contingency planning you should be brainstorming it you should be war gaming what will you do your your management and each section uh, should be thinking uh, what can what will i do if this goes what all can go wrong firstly you know i was once organizing a event and a uh, very important event we do it once in 5 years so all departments should come and give presentation i found after two three presentation they are using the same slide with no change i said the next presentation will be next week the presentation will be what all can go wrong in my part of the duties and how will i how will i counter it so thankfully yeah. they had to make new slides then right <laughs> so so uh, uh, ek management mein op there's another thing called hope of success and fear of failure right you know like we say, uh, sir i'll do like this 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 and so then we'll achieve this 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 and nobody ever talks at this if this goes wrong then we will do this and if this goes wrong then we will do this so i think that balance between hope of success you have to be optimistic but contingency to cater for failures is something which may uh, keep us better equipped to uh is unforeseen uh, unforeseen uh, pandemics and such like things that's that's what i think very very difficult to do but that's the way you have to do it and i think now organization should also seriously start investing in technology because by now i am sure most of them have realized that there is no job that cannot be done outside of office that a person doesn't need to actually come to an office and sit in a cabin and perform a job function so i think investing in technology is something that that is becoming their priority now what what do you think i i i personally feel my view would be it has to be a hybrid model right uh, let me assure you right. uh, it's not right. going to be too far when people will be fed up of uh, of you know working from home mm-hmm. right you know uh, imagine sure. the lady especially uh, the household responsibilities otherwise at times were taken the children's expectations the parents and the other expectations were a little bit uh, subdued because you had to go for work now right. uh, and also like the schools and other how much can a person continue to work on a screen right, right. Uh, and right. there is a there is a there is a um a uh, a value in personal interaction right so yes this has taught the world that i can have one third strength of each branch working from home a good thing is that culture has come where i think people have started locking themselves up in the room during the working hours because otherwise right. you know uh, uh, the adverse thing that i have seen with my son and both my sons one is working in us he says my neck is sprained now and he says in a meeting otherwise you can take your attention off but from the screen you can't be looking uh, you know not attentive so uh, people are get tired for sure out of all this but uh, investment in technology good a balance and a hybrid model i feel would be the way forward so wherever because after all if you don't travel too much right. you save on fuel you reduce pollution you are i'm told reducing on rentals mm-hmm. for the offices a mix a mix would be a good idea yeah. 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 good idea i agree yeah. to i agree to and i think in coming few years there will be a surge of uh, psychologists in our country because lot many and many more people will seek psychologists to at least get that peace of mind to find that calm inside their minds because there are the boundaries are blurred i mean there are no weekends anymore you are not driving you're not listening to music while driving there is no way to unwind now you're constantly working from home so absolutely, yeah i believe yeah. absolutely yeah in fact even like 5 days work 
is spilling over to Saturday because Absolutely. as it is, you are on call, you are on phone call away. So the bosses do drive their subordinates to achieve those targets. Yeah. <laughs> Very yeah, true. Yeah. And even if your laptop is not switched off, you're constantly, if your laptop is switched off, you're constantly checking mails and messages on your phone as a part of your habit. So you are you are actually never switched off your brain from work. This is the hugest, I think it's the, it's the biggest disadvantage of working from home now. Yeah, Great. Um, we, we are at the end of this discussion now. Um, if there are any questions from the audiences, um, please leave them in the comments. I'm going to wait for a few seconds, sir, if there are any questions. Otherwise, we'll wrap up the session. Great. Great. Great discussions. I mean, personally, it's, it, it's a great masterclass for me. I mean, honestly, I learned so much because I know for sure... Um, my my family are my family doesn't have an army background as such but um being surrounded by uh, you know such families has i have seen how early in their lives people in armed forces um, you know uh, right from leading a small troop of men to leading the whole organizations it's it's a it's a gradual growth in the leadership level as well. So that's mm, absolutely it's commendable. It's or how it's was it's your first book when you led? Say again. How big was Any, your first troop? My first uh, experience in the army, you say? My, your first troop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How big was your first troop? See, you know, I was in ASC, but for one year you go with infantry. So I was in Arunachal Pradesh, right? So uh, right. Right. you are the number two person in a company of 100 men. But my most uh, right. telling experience was I used to volunteer to go for patrols. Patrols right. means training, right? So right. on the China right. border in Arunachal, you go out for 10, 15 days with a pack of 30, 40 kgs and you have 20 men because when you are a young officer in the unit, you are the junior most. Even the food in the mess you get lost out of courtesy. So uh, I used to enjoy uh, going out with those 20, 30 men and living in those huts wherever we used to see. Otherwise, we used to have those small bivouacs made out of our ground sheets. And my commanding officer used to ask me, so why do you always volunteer out of these six, right. seven officers to go out? I said, sir, here I'm the junior most, there I command these 30 people. And uh, it, that was one of the most enjoyable thing, most uh, learning experience. And uh, I used to walk, do that walking part from early morning, five o'clock till about 10 o'clock. Then look for a nice uh, grazing hut, spend the day there and next morning. So that, that was the first body of troops that I felt was very did you ever have any fear? Did you ever face any fear of failure as a leader? What if this doesn't work? What if what if it doesn't happen? What if I fail? What if my by my team fails? You know, it's a continuous process always. I mean, in the sense that I have been um, uh, I've been always making sure if you need Five, I always said, if you need five punches to kill something, use seven, right? The only yes. way to get out of that caution of yes. uh, preventing failure was to put in extra effort. Like when I was young, somebody asked me, how many push-ups should we do? I said, till we fall on our nose, as simple as that. You know, uh, uh, and like my wife tells me, he says, you strongly believe in no pain, no gain. So you keep fingering yourself, you know, jab tak, so I uh, I strongly believed in overkill, overkill, and uh, that was out of a, that thing that I can't afford a failure, right? And uh, God has been very kind. People right. love me, people right. junior to me, have been very very. I, I've been very very blessed on that score. But yes, unless you keep that thought in your mind, you just may fail. <laughs> brilliant brilliant right i think we i think we are ready to close the session now okay. thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for sparing this evening for this live session it was a very you. insightful session and
Thank you very much. I enjoyed the conversation and uh, I really hope the audience enjoyed it as much. Uh, it's been a great uh, pleasure interacting with you. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, have a great time hereafter. Thanks. Thank you so much. Sir. Take care of yourself. Stay safe. And uh, we'll be in touch. So please take right. care. All right. Thank okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye. Good Bye. night.